Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a great time at Ignite. And I am here to talk about second party data, as Adam has said. My name is Aruna Paramasivam. I am the GM of Data Marketplace at Lodemy. I have been with Lodemy since July this year, and I come with deep data experience from the industry, having worked at DSPs, brands, as well as other data vendors. So we're here today because we all know the effects of GDPR and our current CCPA status, and we've all had to take a good hard look at the ways that we're using data, and there's been a real need to um, know where your data is coming from, how it's sourced, and of course, a great emphasis on transparency as well. The good news is we have second party data, which takes care of a lot of these issues. We are still able to give consumers the great customer experience that they're looking for, as well as advertisers the results that they need. And I'm here today with a great panel of ad tech leaders who are not just surviving, but thriving in the state of world. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And uh, please also include one fun fact about yourself. <laughs> Great. Well, I am Allie Gordon. I'm the Director of Programmatic Data Sales at Fluent. Um, obviously, we are a second party data provider. I guess a fun fact about myself, which is very hard to come up with um, in a setting like this, is I've never lost a round of Friends trivia. And I welcome any opponent. <laughs> I'm Annie Tan from Spark Foundry. I'm the Director of Data Architecture. Um, I run the team that help our client with the DMP management, data uh, audience recommendations, strategy, pretty much run the gamut. So one fun fact about my, myself is you have to look very carefully. My <laughs> left shoulder is about half an inch shorter than my right shoulder <laughs> because I broke my collarbone during a snowboarding event and I decided I don't want a surgery to cut me open, so I just had the fuse, and now I'm a little bit off center. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny Bradowski. I lead the data sales practice at IBM Watson Advertising, formerly the Weather Channel. Um, I guess a fun, well, interesting fact about me is that I am a native New Yorker, uh, born and bred. Um, originally from the Bronx, and I really am the true Jenny from the block, <laughs> not, not the other one. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pete Candido. I'm the Director of Digital Audience Solutions at Business Watch Network. Uh, we're an e-newsletter publisher and website content uh, provider. Um, but all I've ever really wanted to be is a singer in a rock and roll band, and that's, that's the truth. <laughs> That's great. And my fun fact is I've actually worked with Jenny Pryor on second party data when I was at L'Oreal and she was at Live Nation. And we used to use entertainment data to target um, those who were purchasing certain products. So for example, for a Rihanna concert, we'd look at people that were interested in buying blue um, hair color, for example. And speaking of Jenny from the block, we've also used um, data for Jennifer Lopez um, since she is a beauty celebrity. So there's a fun Fun fact around second party data. So bringing this back to second party data, I would love for you all to share your current experiences buying and selling second party data. We've got an interesting gamut here with um, Annie from the agency side. We've got IBM who buys and sells data. We've got Business Watch Network. And then we've got Fluent, which is very mobile oriented. So we'd love to hear um, what your experiences have been to date. And go ahead. Sure. So um, at its core, Fluent is a performance marketing company. We own and operate a handful of survey and registration-based websites. Um, and what we do on the data side is decouple all of the data that uh, US consumers provide to us by filling out these surveys and registering and making it available to advertisers and publishers as second party data. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm relatively new at Fluent. It's been a, a really fun couple of months for me to really kind of get my hands dirty with uh, second party data. And uh, I found that it's become incredibly valuable to a lot of advertisers and publishers um, who are focusing on transparency and sourcing. Yeah, we, since we manage so many different clients, everyone is slightly different, but we recognize that second party data is definitely more valuable than third party data. But the problem is it's really hard to get that connection going because 
as a personal agency, we don't own the data either. So we have to work with our client to talk to someone who can match with their um, second prior data. For example, we have uh, USAA. They only can have military folks to sign up for their products. So in order to be more efficient in the media, we have to find out um, from a second party vendor what kind of military data do they have if we're going to use it. That is a very high touch endeavor because we had to start getting people to talk together and the, the prices need to be negotiated. So we know it's valuable, but it's difficult. And it's something that we try to make it more efficient, but because we know that your first part data is our second part data and you value them so much and you want to protect them and we recognize that, and that makes it a lot more difficult to have that conversation and get it started. So Annie, I'm actually gonna ask you another question based on that. Do you have any advice for um, some of our DMP clients here on how to price their data, how to assess the marketplace, and how to work with agencies like yourself? So performance is still important. So if you price it too high and we lay that on top of the media spend and the performance might be great, but with everything um, calculated together, the performance will be still low. And we can make the justification to the client of using your data. So it's kind of chicken and egg situation. We know it's valuable, but we have to make sure that it's still a performing set of campaigns with the data. And as an agency, we are very transparent of what, how did you perform, you did, did not, and why. And maybe you can negotiate after the fact, even if it performed well, but because you charged so high, it didn't perform well. And that's kind of a negotiation um, discussion that we have to have because we want to leverage a good set of data, then go out to the exchange and pick up a third party data set that we know might not do as well. Okay, great. And Jenny? Uh, so the way that we look at second party data is a little different. So, you know, every no one is immune to weather, right? I think the majority of the country before they put their foot on the floor in the morning already know the weather. Um, I decide what my day is going to be like, what my weekend's going to be like, based off of the weather that's going to be coming. Um, one of the things that we have done that has been, you know, pretty well received in market is a cookie-less weather solution. Um, it's not so much about the who, it's about the where and the when. Um, and so we have been monetizing it in market more of like a, a pre-bid filter um, using, you know, types of neural learning networks and artificial intelligence to do regression analysis um, across the country, across the 42,000 zip codes. Uh, and our clients have found it very useful in addition to other data tactics as well, right? So, you know, weather is a driver of consumer behavior and emotion, um, and it's important to be able to target your consumers when they're in the right mindset. Pete? Well, as an as a e-newsletter publisher and a, a, a website a content platform, we're a little different because we actually own the data for the engagements uh, across all of the contact, uh, content that we track. So, so our data is first party, and our data ends up becoming the second party data when we go to a, a platform like Lotomy. So um, from a first party standpoint, though, in, in addition to having data available on the exchanges, we're in a B2B environment, so we do a lot in the lead generation area, um, also content marketing and email marketing area. Um, but obviously for here today, uh, the first party data, you know, transitioning into second party data with, with Lotomy um, is the key. Yeah, so we actually have um, very interesting verticals here. We have Pete from a B2B standpoint. We have Ali, who is looking at second party data from the mobile perspective. We have weather data, which is just a vital component of everyday lifestyle. And then we also have Annie from the agency side. So I think um, it's pretty interesting to see um, your experiences, but I'm also curious about what kind of challenges you've come across. And we'll start with Pete this time. Yeah, the challenge in terms of, um, you know, the first slash second party data label, uh, you know, scale in the beginning was a big challenge, but uh, we're really overcoming that quickly in terms of increasing the number of engagements with our content and in increasing our reader base. So 
when we talk to clients about you know, second party, first party data, scale is less and less a concern. But the, the biggest issue is believability. And, th and that's because I think a lot of buyers in the marketplace are gun shy as to you know, what really is second party or first party data compared to third party. You, know, you look at brands, you look at um, groups of data, you, sometimes you're just not really sure. So for us, when we're able to uh, you know, take a prospect or client and point them back to our website so that they can see the platform where all the engagement happens and see how people engage with our content and how all the content is flagged into, you know, valuable segments, um, that's where that clarity uh, comes. It, that's, that's something available to us as a first-party data provider, but I can see the challenge being even tougher for everyone else on the panel. Yeah, I mean, in the past, coming from the publisher world, I definitely understand the struggle of first party scale. Um, in the instance of weather, we don't necessarily have that problem because weather is always happening, right? But the one interesting thing and the one challenge that we really have is everyone is looking for a cookie-free solution, right? We have one. But when you actually explain to someone that it's not an audience segment, it, it just doesn't resonate, right? So that's really our, our biggest challenge is educating the market on how it's not about the who, it's about the where and when. I think the biggest challenge for us right now is really educating our clients that we should look into second party data because they know what their first party data is. They understand third party data. Second party data, they're like, well, it's someone else's data. What can we do with someone else's data? So the education process takes a bit and then now on the other side, when we do approach someone with their own second, uh, their own first party data and we approach them with a proposal, they then have the reverse. It's like, well, it's my data. I, I don't want to give it to anyone. And then it becomes more of a process of getting everyone together on the, in this, on the same room, discussing why they're using it. One person might say, I don't want you to do this because then it will impact my brand, my value, and then impact my consumer. And a lot of times the conversation just ends right there. I think rounding out the education piece, um, that's definitely the biggest challenge for us at Fluent as well. Um, educating the marketplace on the differences between first party data, which is what we're collecting on our owned and operated properties, sharing it with specific advertisers and publishers, making it second party data, and why that kind of first to second party data uh, transition is, in our opinion, a lot more valuable than third party data that doesn't necessarily have a clear path of transparency and sourcing. So you brought up third party data. So I'm very curious. I think everyone understands first party data. It's your own data. Everyone knows how they're collecting it, but I'm very curious how you view second party data versus third party data. For d uh, almost a decade now, we've all been using um, third party data very freely, and uh, we've figured out ways that it works for us. But do you feel both are gonna have a certain niche in this data targeting world we live in, or how do you see this uh, moving forward? I think there's definitely room for third party data as well as Again, first party to us, second party to uh, the partner within the world of advertising. Um, there are times when you know recent search activity or internet activity as a whole can be a timely way for advertisers to reach consumers very broadly. Um, that said, I think if uh, consumers or clients and advertisers are trying to reach consumers on a more one-to-one -one basis, um, optimizing media spend and reducing waste, utilizing that second party data um, that again is more transparent and more foundationally sourced is going to be incredibly important moving forward. Yes, I think second party data definitely will help expand the client's uh, reach. Some folk that they might not, consumer they might not have in the first party data, but definitely align with their um, goals. For example, on Macy's, we have, they have L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, and there is a, le they leverage the Lancome second, a uh, first party data, which is Macy's second party data, to both target and suppress. So there's alignment. Again, it's a great usage and great uh, use case for that, but, um, 
but we still use third party data to expand, expand the reach because it's still a very small set of data relative to the third party universe. So it's moving into that realm. However, because it's such a large brand, they want the, the volume and we can't say we can't do it. So we have to have strategies for second party and third party execution and then execute on those tactics. That makes sense. Um, what I always hear from clients, and I'm sure, Annie, you could relate to this, is non-working media dollar budgets are about this big, yeah. right? <laughs> Agreed. So we need to make sure that that piece is filled with the best and most applicable data. Um, I think it's definitely always going to be a combination of second and third party data. Um, if you do all second party data, you're not going to perform because it's going to be too expensive, right? So finding the right mix, I think, is imperative. Um, the other thing that I believe really sets first party data on just a different path is measurement, right? So right now, if you're targeting a third party data set, being able to measure the outcome from that from a client, it's kind of clouded, right? Because you don't really know what's in those segments. Um, when you're using a first party, you're able to really drive it back um, to the seed data source and slice and dice it most likely uh, differently than you would be able to for third party. Yeah, I think, I think using the, the right combination of second, third party data is obviously the answer. The, the trick is, is that it's not easy to do. So um, second party data represents uh, a, a known entity, a known data source. Uh, you know, more security in terms of privacy sensitivity, right, as opposed to third-party data. Um, but third-party data provides, the, you know, usually a much larger scale um, and, and is less expensive, right, lower CPM. So um, I, I think that over time, as first-party data becomes more available on platforms as second-party data and that community grows, that, that price level will come down. But, you know, ideally, if you're in the marketplace as a buyer and you could find reputable, uh, branded second party data and use that and then fill with third party data to get the rest of your scale, that's an ideal situation. Yeah. Not always easy to do, but. Yeah, I think situation. we all agree um, that it seems like third party data is always going to be necessary to augment and also to balance cost and also for some sort of suppression use cases. So curious to um, know what your thoughts are around CCPA and if you think this is going to completely change the world of data targeting and were there any lessons that you learned from GDPR that applied to you that you could um, help um, educate the audience on? Sure, I'll go. Okay. <laughs> so I joined uh, IBM in the beginning of the year. And I have to say, I've never seen processes quite like this in terms of vetting and compliance. Uh, my colleague is laughing um, because it, it really was eye-opening for me. Um, if the rest of the data, e data ecosystem has to go through the same tactics and levels of approvals that we have had through legal, through internal boards, I think that we're gonna have a much cleaner house. And I'm excited to see who makes it. <laughs> <laughs> so on the agency side, since we don't own any data, mm -hmm. we have a guidance for our clients, but we also make sure that clients go back to their own legal counsel and like follow their stance because we don't want to say anything contradictory to what their legal counsel says. And the fact that CCP is still being hammered out right now, nothing is solid. So it's what, that's why we make that recommendation. And also, Publicis have a platform called Verified. And this is a process that all platforms, data partners, everyone has to go through and they answer, I would say, hundreds and thousands. <laughs> Ali's laughing because she had the process to answer all those questions about security, privacy, and in order for us to ensure a client is using the data that's as compliant as possible for all um, rules and regulations of global uh, countries and laws, we follow that. We understand it will change the landscape. It will make the third party size smaller possibly or however the outcome is, but our due diligence is to a client. That's a fiduciary responsibility. If we can make recommendation on something that might give them the liability and have them go into problems in the future. 
Yeah, I, for us directly, GD, GDPR was not, didn't really have an effect because we're mainly a U.S. data provider. But indirectly, it, it did what any privacy legislation over the years has done, whether it's, I mean, I'm the gray bearded guy in the, in the room, so I can tell you direct mail, email, uh, into digital. I've gone through many, many rounds of, of privacy and security legislation and, and self-regulation. Uh, and it, it changes the way we do things, and ultimately it makes us better. So it doesn't, it doesn't turn everything around, but it makes us all, uh, we have heightened sensitivity over privacy. We try to do better things with our data as a seller, as well as a buyer. So it's, it really becomes part of, you know, what we do as marketers, we have to absorb it and learn from it, and, and we move forward, hopefully better, yeah. which we have. Fluent is in kind of an interesting position just based on our co data collection methodology in that 100% of the data that we bring to market is fully opted in and fully declared. So while I do think CCPA is going to be huge for um, the data, data ecosystem as a whole, we are already fully compliant, so we're kind of sitting pretty. Um, but it will be interesting to see what happens moving forward um, and how it kind of ruffles feathers in, in the ecosystem. Yeah, it will be interesting. So I'm also curious how you determine if a particular data set is successful. What does success look like from your perspective and the organizations that you're with? And what kind of metrics do you use to really determine ROI? We've talked about costs and how second party data can sometimes be quite expensive to use in bulk. So just um, would love to hear your perspectives on this. Well, I'm a seller, so from a seller, and I, I think we're going to hear this, but from a seller, data seller's perspective, uh, the metrics that tell us our data is good, it comes from our clients, right? So if they, sh they will sometimes share metrics with us, but mostly it's based on continued usage of our data and coming back and doing more programs. So um, from a seller's perspective, that's what we have to depend on. But we know as a, as a data supplier and a first-party data um, you know, engagement you know, content engagement company, that we have to keep bringing out valuable segments that, you know, ta good targeted segments that people are looking for and continue to maintain and try to increase the quality of the data. Because, I mean, the quality of the data speaks to first and second party and speaks to everything that we've been talking about, whether it be privacy legislation or whether the data is working for clients and, you know, what the right mix is. So that's, that's what it all really comes down to. One of the things that I actually have been uh, working on recently is, you know, well, we ask 100 top CMOs if weather affects their business, and they all say yes, but nobody knows how, right? Um, so one of the things that uh, we, one of the tools that we have are more analytics that really allow clients to measure it against their first party data to see how weather is affecting their business, where and when, and then turn it into activation, right? So aside from exactly what, what you had said, whatever a client says is their goal, that's their goal, that's how they're gonna measure it. Um, on our side, we're looking more at the results of the analytics and how that ties back to performance. The success of data really ties to just success of the client. So we have high level success as just, such as a house engagement, penetration, brand lift, everything is kind of high level, and then the individual campaign, even performance on the placement. And that is like either ROAS, um, uh, cost per site visit, so it becomes very analytics. So the entire team is dedicated to dealing with this, that kind of analytics, and us bringing in data, it just helps to improve that. If any data set, either first party, second party, third party data set that we bring in, if it can improve the performance on all those metrics that we are measured against, then that's success. Do you have different clients that use different metrics, though, in different verticals, different yes. levels of sophistication? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so we have CPG clients that is really household penetration of the product on the purchase. Um, it, then no one's going to visit their website to sign up for anything, such as Campbell's. People are just going to buy the soup or not buy the soup. We can't use their, they don't have that much first part data. So the metrics is household penetration and a sales lift. And that's a longer term performance determination. While other things like Audible, it's someone sign up or not sign up. And that's a much quicker performance metrics to evaluate if something worked well or not. 
So every client is very distinct in how performance is gauged, and we as the audience and data team, and even the entire uh, team that supports those clients have to work against those metrics. And how about from the mobile perspective? For us, we do also have to rely pretty heavily on the clients to give us feedback as to whether or not a specific segment is performing. That said, before we recommend any specific segment to a client, um, things such as scale and um, third-party validators such as Nielsen DAR studies are all taken into consideration to ensure that we're providing um, an audience that the client actually will find uh, usable and worthwhile. And then um, moving forward, um, I just wanted to um, ask if you have a great example of a second party data relationship that you've created using creativity. And maybe I'll let Annie go because I feel you probably have a lot of clients who've um, had different experiences. And have you even brought clients together to share data and yeah, that sort so, of scenario? Yeah, um, so the L'Oreal example with Macy is definitely one that is that makes sense and one could kind of hear that it makes sense. So that was easy to approach and doesn't really need that much creativity because it just makes sense. Um, one that we tried to bring together but it's been difficult was um, Campbell's, this pasta sauce, and Baby Center. We know Baby Center have the real good knowledge of when babies are born, what age they are, and when a baby's born, about nine months down the line, they will start eating solid food, which would be First thing we pasta, spaghettis, and whatnot, and that needs the sauce. That's a little bit difficult to bring together because Baby Center wants to sell the data with the media, but we want to decouple that. So that conversation is a little bit harder to be had, but we want to explore that kind of direction is pasta sauce and baby, it's a little bit leap. So we, those are the things that we want to bring to the client and bring to the partners. And sometimes it's just hard to get that conversation going. Yeah. What about with weather data? So actually, I'm going to use one of your accounts as, as an example. Um, so in the instance of Campbell's, right, soup, as you can imagine, uh, it's cold out, it's inclement weather coming, there's a polar vortex coming, everyone's stocking up on soup. Um, and also a few things that we found out um, is what recipes through our conversational marketing, what recipes are people utilizing Campbell's soups for? Um, so that was helpful in creating special triggers. So in the instance there, we were able to take, since Campbell's obviously isn't going to share their first party sales data with us, um, we were able to go get some soup data, um, people who are buying soup down at the zip code level, and we were able to build a trigger based off of what exact weather condition at the zip code level drives someone into a store to buy soup. And so we started using that trigger with you guys, um, and from what I understand, it's been quite successful. Yeah, those are, that's actually pretty interesting because um, different weather happens across the country, and the trigger does help with the messaging and, and the even the video that shows up. So someone who is sitting in Florida, nice and warm, is not gonna respond to the one who's sitting up in Colorado there under two inches of snow right now. So the weather data is definitely very useful for our clients. Thank you. <laughs> um, from the B2B world? Yeah. From a B2B world, the creativity is a little different. Yeah. It doesn't involve soup, <laughs> for sure. I think the real trick is getting the weather to be right to drive people to buy the soup, but I don't know how you guys do that. Um, in, the, in, the B2B, in the B2B market, it's, it's more about uh, partnering with clients who might want to have us work with their data to um, overlay demographics or buying activity um, or maybe take domains and bring you know, intent data over to them. Uh, that, that's really the type of creativity that you deal with more in B2B. Um, so. But, and that happens a lot. And Ali, I know you have a lot of mobile publishers, so anything there that you could share? Yeah, for us, um, over the past couple of months, we've really transitioned from focusing just on advertisers and agencies to publishers as well. So enabling publishers to utilize our first party data for their purposes to target um, specific audiences based on campaigns that they currently have running. For instance, um, 
quite a few large CPG clients um, require specific on-target percentages um, when running on publishers. So we've been able to give them access to our demo data, which is 85 to 95% on target to increase budgets that are allocated to them um, and utilizing Lodomy to do so um, as a great distribution partner. Great. And last question, given your great backgrounds in ad tech, where do you think data creation or sourcing is going to come from next in our industry? I'll start this one because I actually really enjoy this. Um, it's everywhere. It's where the consumer is located, it's where they are going. So IoT, podcasts, audio, CTV, anything that consumers is located where they are, where they're consuming the data and we want to collect it. So one of the things that we do have is called Innovation Lab in Spark where someone, his job is looking at all the new technologies and how we can leverage it both by um, as a a, a media source and also has a way of collecting data. And one thing that I was talking to my team was, you know, on Campbell's, those refrigerators that you can have a camera to look into your fridge, wouldn't be that nice to get that information and just suggest maybe you can eat a cup of Campbell's soup or Prego sauce because you're kind of short on that. Yeah. So it's, it's everywhere. Um, we are exploring with different partners, uh, different teams, and different vendors to make sure that we are up as, um, as to the edge of technology as possible because we want to make sure we bring everything to the client and we're not behind on anything. Yeah, that's really interesting, the talking refrigerators they have now and so many um, smart home devices. Anyone else? Uh, considering we, you know, we've been talking about second party data and the challenges of uh, privacy legislation, things like that. So through mobile and web and all kinds of devices and all the, all the platforms we talk about, I think it's, it's, it's really going to be important for content to be engaging and for be able to track that content so that you have the true intent data and you know, possible buying activity. But, and then we're going to have more and more of that. The, the second party data pool is going to grow and, and that's, you know, that's going to come from a lot of different platforms and a lot of different devices. And I just think compliance is going to continue to be um, paramount in data sourcing in the next couple of years. So I think um, data providers that are receiving consent um, are going to be the ones thriving over the next couple of years. I mean, I have to say I'm, I'm excited that we are entering this world just because I am monetizing a cookie-less solution. <laughs> But I am interested to see, you know, how others are really going to combat this in terms of collection. Um, I also want to urge everyone that if you are monetizing second party data to get measurement results on your specific data set with your clients, um, because that's what's been successful for me over the years, really showing the value of second party data. Well, fantastic. That was a great discussion on second party data, and we have some key takeaways for everyone. I'll start. I think just from this discussion, we can see that second party data promises to be the life of the party, but scale is a real challenge. And this is why Lodomy recently introduced a new solution, the private data exchange. Um, this invites premium publishers to contribute um, their first party data into our data exchange, and we're able to distribute this in a very private privacy compliant way um, to our clients um, for them to use. It's a name your own price, which will take care of some of the negotiations that Annie said that she is sometimes involved with from the agency side. And this is also a great way for um, buyers and sellers to speak to each other in a uh, very transparent way where they know exactly where their data is coming from. So that's my takeaway. Um, We'll go down the line. Um, mine is pretty simple, basically combining precision with transparency, which I know is something I've said a lot since I've been on the stage, so I apologize for that. Um, but combining those two second party data should be top of mind for all data centric advertisers. So I think I said it too. My response when the agency response is to the client, so we need to provide a transparency on scale, data source, performance, everything, because that's our response to them. 
So regardless of second party, third party, even the own first party, we have to tell them if their first party data is working or not. So transparency is key on all metrics and all steps of the way. I guess based off of a conversation that we had recently, um, it seems that there are a lot of publishers that are still very resistant to decoupling their data from their media. Um, and I know how challenging that is having to done it a few times, um, but it's like ripping off a Band-Aid, so just do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, buyers have to do their due diligence in terms of really trying to uh, key in on who the true first, second party data providers are. Um, all data is not created equal in either a second party or a third party data set, so obviously the testing continues, but where you can identify second party data and you know it's going to be the privacy is not going to be a question. Um, you're going to be feel more secure about using it. You know, try to use that second party data separately. Test it against the third party data for scale, and you know, and continue to to improve that process. Great. We hope you've enjoyed this panel on second party data. Thank you.